What's up everyone, this is Dr. Webb here. Thank you guys for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe, new videos coming every week. Today I have a very special guest. She's gonna tell us about being a mortician as well as why she chose it and some tips for you guys. Um, welcome, Melissa, how are you doing? Hi, doing good, thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself to uh, tell everybody who you are. Hi, my name is Melissa Estrada Gannon. And um, I am actually a, now a medical student, but uh, my prior training included being a funeral director and an embalmer. Okay. And uh, when people talk about being a mortician or a funeral director, embalmer, can you explain kind of what that is? Yeah. So basically, um, any postmortem care that a deceased has, um, some people, when they pass, they go to... Um, a funeral home and uh, that's kind of where my job began. Um, I was dual licensee in funeral directing and embalming so basically I could do from A to Z. Mm -hmm. um, I could go from making a first call which is where you go pick up the deceased at uh, whatever site that they passed whether it be a hospital, um, a nursing home, or um, a private residence, we would go and do the pickups. Um, and then we would bring them back to the funeral home and do whatever arrangements we had set up with the family. Um, so that's basically um, in a short little yeah. summary of what I would do. Um, and then that also, of course, included um, meeting with the family, making the arrangements beforehand, or if it was a sudden death, um, then we would meet with them um, as soon as we could to make the arrangements um, and what that entitled. Okay. And what got you interested in, in it? How did you get into this particular field? I get that question this, this a lot. It's not a field that some people just kind of fall into. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't hear about a lot of people who do this, so I'm kind of interested in hearing. I get that question a lot. Um, I'm not just like naturally creepy. Yeah. When people <laughs> think of uh, morticians, they think of like the yeah. middle-aged creepy old man in the background <laughs> that's like sneaking around with dead bodies. Um, yeah. So basically, I had always had an interest in medicine. Uh, okay. So anatomy to me was very appealing. Um, but never in a million years did I think I would do something like that. And uh, one of my cousins, he's been a mortician for now close to 30 years. Wow. And uh, in the last um, 10 years or so, he decided to set up his own funeral home. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that at that time, um, it was the best uh, professional move for me. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I fell into it. Um, but really, my first visit to a funeral home was when I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly enough, it was on Halloween, um, <laughs> kind of appropriate. Yeah. Um, and I just, I, I realized very early on that I was not... Um, I wasn't afraid or, yeah. or squeamish, so I figured that would be interesting. It was always in the back of my mind. Got you. And you say that uh, when you pick up the, the bodies from either the nursing home, the hospital, or even from the scene, how was that experience? Because I, I can imagine kind of seeing a, a body, someone who's passed away, uh, that can be frightening for some people. Uh, what, what was that experience like for you? So even though I've been exposed and I, I've had all of these experiences beforehand, um, it was very awkward mm -hmm. and uh, intimidating for me because one thing that you don't realize is when you go and you, when you go on a first call, uh, whether it be with your partner or by yourself, um, you have you have an audience basically. Yep. And um, when it's in a private residence, it's, I think, a little harder because you, you're basically getting a phone call and they say, okay, so-and-so has passed away. We need you to come and get them. Mm -hmm. um, you don't know very much. I try and, I, and ask the weight of the person just because of, you know, my own body limitations. Yeah. Um, Are you by yourself usually? I, I would go by myself a lot. Wow. I was very busy. So wow. you have to find creative ways to compensate for, you know, me being like five feet tall yeah. and, you know, not, you know, the biggest person or yeah. the strongest person. I would have to find ways to compensate for that. Um, but basically I would ask, um, whether it's a private residence, I would ask, um, the weight of the person, 
Um, that way I could get a better idea of do I need to wait until someone is there with me or is this something that I can do on my own? Sometimes they aren't very accurate and they'll say, oh, they're like 150 yeah. and then show up <laughs> and it's like 300 pounds. Yeah. Like, okay, you just have to manage. Um, and you never know how big the residence is going to be. You don't know if your cot's going to fit through the hallway. Um, so you have to find creative ways to get them. Uh, you don't know how many people are going to be there. You don't know um, if there's going to be any family drama. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, these people are grieving. Yeah. And people grieve in different ways. So um, it, you never really knew what you were walking into. I yeah. kind of compare it to... Um, you know, EMTs, when they get phone calls, mm -hmm. they don't know what they're walking into either. Um, there's been some interesting situations that I've walked into, but you just try and do your best. But that's basically what a first call entails. Gotcha. And then you pick up the body, take him to the funeral home. And what's kind of the uh, process after that? And can you explain kind of the embalming process and explain what embalming is? So basically, um, the most important thing to get is... Um, legal permission to start anything you basically cannot um start any type of procedure uh have you if you don't have any legal permission um because legally it can be seen as mutilation mm -hmm. so first things first is getting in contact with the family and getting even verbal permission um so basically the embalming portion of it in the state of texas and i'm only familiar with uh texas laws because I've only practiced in Texas. Um, but basically in Texas, you're not required to be embalmed, um, but uh, the funeral homes, most of them require it just for um, you know, biohazard safety uh, with people coming and viewing. Um, so just as an FYI, uh, embalming basically is where you use uh, different preservatives, formaldehyde um, in different concentrations to uh, not only preserve the body, but also help with um, sanitary purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically what you do, and you have two types that you can categorize it into, um, and it's based on where the patient is coming from. So are they coming from a medical examiner's office, and those are autopsy cases, um, or the second type is basically, you know, just a regular individual with no autopsy mm. um, and then you kind of branch off from there uh, the autopsy cases you um, it's kind of your job is made a little bit easier just because they already have their Y incision yeah. which you can access them uh, you can access the vessels um, but in a regular person that isn't autopsied uh, you try and have a one-point injection which is basically um, going through the carotid and the jugular mm -hmm. um, and simultaneously draining the blood and injecting the formaldehyde solution. Um, and as you're doing that, um, you basically have to do a lot of like deep massage tissues mm -hmm. to just to uh, get the blood flowing because there's no pulse. There's yeah. nothing moving it. Um, and the pressure alone isn't enough. Uh, to get some of the clots out. So you just have to do a lot of deep tissue massaging, uh, make sure everything is going. Um, the interesting thing is whenever they have recently passed away and they mm. haven't been waiting for a while, um, the easier my job is because the mm. blood is still uh, fairly fluid. Gotcha. Um, and in a way, it kind of creeps me out a little bit. I always go back <laughs> and make sure they don't have a pulse before I start my procedure. Because, oh, gotcha. You know, it's, they're, they're still warm. Yeah, and the, uh, you put in formaldehyde in it and it kind of causes, allows the body not to decay. Is that kind of a, okay. And yeah, how does the process take? Um, if I'm by myself and it's a bigger individual, it could take me about a couple of hours, two, three mm -hmm. hours. Okay. Um, and it also depends on whether it's a one point injection mm -hmm. or if they have, which a lot of Americans have, um, any, um, like sclerotic vessels or yeah. any, um, any issues with circulation. Sometimes you start embalming and you notice their left arm isn't changing, mm -hmm. isn't turning pink. 
So then you have to go and you have to find another vessel to inject specifically just the arm or you'll start injecting and then you'll have to go through the femoral because your right leg isn't changing a nice pink color. So um, it just depends on how uh, clean their circulatory system gotcha. is for sure. And what about the, the bodies, the families that want their bodies to be cremated? How does that come into play? So it, um, you can have what's called like a direct cremation. Uh -huh. And we're actually seeing that trend where um, most people are leaning more towards cremation because it's actually more affordable. Mm. Um, so you can have a direct cremation, which is basically we don't embalm if we don't need to. And then we, we do the first call and we set up uh, with the crematory um, to do the soonest. And um, you basically transport them from the pickup to the funeral home to the crematorium. Yeah. And, uh, a lot of crematories, they have viewing rooms where basically the family can get together and uh, they have like access to see the oven, you know, for lack of a better term. Yeah. <laughs> um, the um, cremation chamber, I guess gotcha. we'll call it. Um, and that process takes about four hours to do for a normal sized person. Oh. Um, what was the weirdest request that you got? Because I, I've seen a picture online recently where a guy who supposedly he had passed away and the family at his funeral had him sitting up playing a PlayStation. He had glasses on, had some food next to him. Did you get any weird requests like that? Um, so the, not, not really personally, but I, in school, when I was going through mortuary school, um, we did learn about uh, interesting circumstances like that. And it's, it's very real. You can pretty much embalm somebody in any position that you want them to. Because when, as soon as you start injecting, yeah. um, you know, they're still fairly limber. And at the same time, when you're massaging, you're breaking the rigor mortis. Mm -hmm. So um, basically with that, uh, they become more limber. But as the formaldehyde starts uh, setting in, yeah. Uh, you start preserving and you start hardening in whatever position you're in. So technically you can, uh, the weirdest thing that I've seen is uh, a gentleman who was embalmed uh, sitting on his motorcycle. Oh, okay. He loved his motorcycle. Yeah. That was the thing. So they actually embalmed him um, in that position. Um, but me personally, weird requests. Um, I've had people ask if they can um, be buried with their dogs, um, mm -hmm. which in the state of Texas, most cemeteries are not okay with that. Yeah. Um, just because it's, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, not that I'm aware of. I actually can't think of a cemetery that would do that. Gotcha. Um, but weird requests. I've had people ask me to, um, cut uh, like pieces of hair off mm. of their loved ones because they want to keep a lock of hair. Gotcha. Um, I've seen people who want to come in during the embalming procedure, mm -hmm. which is a little weird for me. Uh, we don't you, you, are you okay with that usually? No, we don't oh, generally okay. allow that. Um, actually, personally, I, I was going through mortuary school when um, you know, my grandmother passed away and I was very adamant about being there. I want to be there when I embalm her and, mm -hmm. and I want to do everything I can for her. I want to be in charge of her and take care yeah. of her. Um, and my cousin actually refused to let me because he said, you know, it's very different to see a loved one yeah. alive and it's very different to see them, you know, exposed, yeah. if you will. Um, but I did, um, was able to go in and uh, clothe her. And that's something very interesting to me. One of the most, um, probably the most personal part of this whole process to me was actually dressing them, mm -hmm. doing their makeup. Um, it seems very basic, but if you think about it, you go your whole life, you know, after infancy, you, you go your whole life dressing yourself, bathing yourself, washing your hair by yourself. And it's, there's something very personal about that. So to me, um, it was always a very, uh, I, I always tried to be gentle with them, you know, and uh, 
I just basically tried to treat them the way I would want my mother treated, my father treated, um, because even though they're, they've passed, um, you know, they were still people at one point. So sometimes I would be embalming or washing their hair or, you know, whatever it may be. And I accidentally like bump their head against something. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones. You know, I, I yeah. apologize just because they're people, you know, and it's very easy to forget um, to dehumanize them once they've passed because they can't complain, you know, they can't grimace. So, um, yeah, I, I just, that was always a very personal part of me. Uh, as a as a mortician gotcha. going through that process but. and you spoke about the education a little bit can you speak about what schooling certifications is required to become one yeah so i actually um had my bachelor's in biology uh when i was pre-med um but they have a completely separate it's an associate's degree uh with the san antonio college um it was a, a terrific department um and uh, they, they've had very successful stories um, from students and, and how well they've evolved in their profession. Um, so in San Antonio, um, you're able to go and mortuary school is about two years. Mm -hmm. I was able to do it in one um, just because I already had uh, previous um, science courses that um, are necessary for the degree. Mm -hmm. Um, and then once you get your degree, um, you graduate with that, and then you're able to um, go and take your national board exams. Mm -hmm. um, you have two. One is for, like, science, and if you decide you want to do the um, embalming licensing, and mm -hmm. the other one is more of, like, a business management type of uh, national board exam um, if you want to just do the funeral directing portion. Gotcha. And after that, you do you have to do an apprenticeship? Yes. Is that required? Okay. Yes. After that, um, you uh, register to uh, complete your apprenticeship, pretty much. Um, and it's a, an entire year that you go through. You collect all of your cases. Um, when I was going through it, um, I finished almost all of it. And then I decided, um, no, I'm pretty sure I want to still do medicine. And that's yeah. when I <laughs> kind of switched back to what I was originally going towards. Um, but after you finish that year and you submit all of your cases, you have to be very diligent about your documentation. Mm -hmm. um, every, just like, you know, in surgery, you have to document the mm -hmm. uh, operative report. Same, very same concept with um, doing your embalming cases. You mm -hmm. have to be very diligent about everything for legal purposes. Um, and once you finish that year, then you've officially been licensed, gotcha. and not just provisional licensing. Gotcha. And after your, all your training, uh, your associates, or and then it's a certificate in your apprenticeship, and I know it varies by location and, and kind of where you are, but how much can a mortician expect to make after that? Um, honestly, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Hmm. Um, I would guess it'd be somewhere around um, 60, 75, depending on the state. Mm -hmm. um, but what most people plan on doing is owning their own funeral home. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where the money is. Gotcha. Um, because you're able to, um, you know, manage how many cases you do. Um, it's, it comes with a lot of responsibility. Uh, mm -hmm. You're pretty much attached to your phone. Uh, my cousin who owns the funeral home, um, there's no days off. People wow. pass away at all hours of the day. And if he doesn't have a mortician to go take care of it, he'll leave at two in the morning mm. to go do it. Um, this can't just leave someone there laying yeah, yeah. You know, in their home because the decay process starts as soon as, you know, you pretty much pass. Um, so it's, it's a never ending job for sure. You're always on call. I expect to always be on call. Um, and that's not including whatever business, um, issues come up. Oh, I happen to have a leak in my bathroom in my business. I need to go take care of that. Um, so he's pretty much on call all the time. Um, and he, you know, attached to his phone, uh, mm -hmm. do expect that. 
But um, if you're not the uh, funeral home owner, then um, you can have like shift work basically. And you're able to have a, a fairly regular life, I would say. Gotcha. And now as a medical student, congrats, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, how does it feel? Very surreal and exciting. Um, it's kind of one of those things that I, I so a little bit about myself um, and overcoming obstacles, I guess. Um, I applied twice to medical school, um, once during undergrad, my senior year, um, and then I reapplied a second time. Both times, no interviews. Um, I really had a hard time with it. So right at that time was when my uh, cousin needed help with his funeral home. So um, I went back to school, became a mortician. I did that for a couple of years. Um, but I just knew that it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, so I just, I figured, what am I going to do now? Um, I was a little lost for a mm -hmm. minute. Uh, I applied to PA school. I actually was waitlisted at a school. I reapplied to PA school. I was waitlisted again. Wow. And uh, this fifth time I decided, okay, um, what is it that I really want to do? And medical school just kept coming back and coming back. So in the two years leading up to this fifth time that I applied, mm -hmm. um, I did absolutely everything that I could to revamp myself as an applicant um, to gain more experience. Um, I worked for a year at an infectious disease clinic because mm -hmm. um, I was interested in working with HIV and AIDS patients. Uh, and I really enjoyed that. And uh, I basically didn't have a day off for two years. Mm -hmm. um, Monday through Friday, I was either at the funeral home or at the ID clinic. Mm -hmm. And then on the weekends, I was still scribing at the hospital in the ER um, and all to try and get into med school. And this cycle, I interviewed at three schools um, and I actually uh, ended up matching to UT Rio Grande Valley. And I'm very, very excited. I'm their awesome. third incoming class. Um, yeah, nice. <laughs> so it's exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. And those years of reapplying, what kind of advice would you give to students who are interested in medicine, either applying the first time or reapplicating? Yeah. What, what advice would you give to them? Um, if you're a first time applicant, uh, basically don't be afraid or intimidated to ask people to look over your application. Mm -hmm. That was one issue that I had. I was very self conscious of my writing. You know, to me, my writings are very, uh, very personal so I was always very intimidated to have somebody read it mm -hmm. um, and just basically don't be afraid to ask for help don't be afraid to ask other people well what did you do different or how mm -hmm. did you do this for reapplicants please 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 do not give up if this is really what you want to do um, so many people gave up on me um, not in a malicious way just that people start feeling kind of bad for you, you yeah. know, and they're like, oh, poor girl. Um, I think some of the worst situations that I was in, um, I was a medical scribe trainer. And um, while I'm in the ER scribing, I would see um, students that I had trained as a scribe in their undergrad mm. graduating med school. Wow. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of, uh, it, it's, it stung every time because you see them face to face and they're where you want to be. Yeah. And they look at you and you're like, I'm still scribing. I scribe for eight years. You wow. know? And um, so definitely the most important piece of advice that I can give is uh, people will give up on you. People will lose faith in you. Uh, your friends will move on, succeed without you. But if this is really what you want to do, don't give up. I know easier said than done. Just take a couple of days to sit in your room, eat ice cream and cry. <laughs> Pick yourself back up yeah. and reapply. Yeah. Um, and, and you'll know if this is really what you want and you'll do what it takes to get there. Yep. Yeah, and that's some really good advice. I tell people all the time, if I had to apply to med school for 10 years straight, I would have did it because that's how bad I wanted to be a doctor. And people do it all the time for the NBA, NFL. Yeah other sports law school nursing school so becoming a doctor is um it's along that same path so 
But uh, congratulations on all your success. You. You know, I wish you the best in med school. It would go by really fast. Uh, do, you, do you have an idea what specialties just yet? I know you, it's really so, early to ask that question. This whole first week has been talking about like, our personality traits yeah. and we actually took the A and C um, personality, personality test yeah. that will match you up with specialties. Um, yeah. I've been working in the ER for eight years and up to my very last day of scribing, um, I was excited to get to work. I wanted to go to work. I'm like, what am I going to see today? Um, I like the um, lifestyle of it. Mm -hmm. the uh, diversity in, in complaints of it. Um, and I, I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. Yeah. So um, sitting one minute and then the next minute is like a, a gunshot wound, you know, running in. It's, it was exciting for me. Um, so I think emergency medicine. Um, I also had the uh, wonderful opportunity to shadow an orthopedic surgeon. Oh, man, I wonder who that may be. <laughs> no, no, I really enjoyed that. Um, it was, I just never thought that I was good enough to maybe do surgery, but after yeah. I was shadowing you, and thank you very much for yeah, that no opportunity, worries. by the way, um, I realized, hmm, maybe surgery may be the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm basically going into this with a an open mind. Yep, if I happen absolutely. to fall in love with urology, then I'll do urology. Yeah. Whatever excellent. it may be. Yeah, that's the right, the right attitude to have. Uh, just go into an open mind and you'll eventually kind of find out what you want to do. Yeah. Melissa, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. And I appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you. Congrats thank again. And I um, uh, wish you all the best in med school. Thank you very much, Dr. Webb. You're welcome. And uh, everyone else, thank you guys for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe. New videos come in every week. You don't want to miss them. We'll see you next time.